second thing is, is a rail safety presentation by the BNSF Rail. Uh, after recent events related to train derailments, the village requested that the BNSF attend a board meeting to discuss rail safety. I would like to, to welcome and thank Peter Kosek, Skozy, from BNSF for taking the time to meet with the village this evening. Mr. Skozy. Hey, thank you everybody. Good evening. That's good enough, loud and clear? Perfect. All right. Um, sorry, sir, I'm talking right into your ear. <laughs> um, no, it's all good. So yeah, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I know that um, this issue of rail safety and what we've seen a lot lately in the media in terms of derailments, the unfortunate incidents over in Ohio, um, have sparked a lot of concerns about rail. Um, I'd like to share with you some of the facts and figures about rail safety. I, um, I believe, and I hope at the end of this evening you'll agree that you know shipping anything by rail is still the safest way to move anything over land. Um, and I'll share with you a little bit about the, the stats, a little bit about what we're doing to make rail safe, uh, specifically here in Riverside, but everywhere across our network. Um, and then uh, some of the trainings that we offer and ways we work collaboratively with first responders across the country uh, and here locally as well. So uh, I'm going to go through a quick presentation. I've got a few slides, some charts to share with you. Um, go. There we go. Um, in case you didn't know, uh, BNSF Railway does operate in 28 states, mostly west of the Mississippi. Um, we go all the way to the coast of California, up in Oregon. A lot of the business that you see traveling through here is going to be container traffic coming from the west coast ports. Uh, some of it from uh, northwest, out of Seattle, um, even some from up in Canada coming down. And then uh, LA, Long Beach is uh, where we get the uh, preponderance of them. 32,000 route miles, 28 states, a bunch of bridges, a bunch of ports, a bunch of intermodal facilities. Um, Rail, uh, has, transporting hazardous material by rail is safe. And I know that that does, that's a little comfort for those who do experience a derailment in their community, like those in East Palestine. Uh, but the fact remains that 99.99% of all hazardous material shipped by rail on BNSF arrives safely. So that, uh, it does happen. There is that 0.01%. Uh, but when you consider the amount that we move, um, you know, the vast, vast majority does arrive safely to its destination. It's important also to note that as a railroad, we have common carrier obligations. We are required to move anything that someone gives to us to move. We can't be selective. We can't pick and choose which things we want to move. Um, so if someone gives us a, a rail car of hazardous materials, we are required by law to move that. Um, we do it, of course, in the safest way that we can. Um, rail is the safest mode. If you look at this chart, you might see the tall red bars, which are, represent incidents, um, hazmat incidents by shipping method. The red bars represent the shipping method of highway. And if you look really down near the bottom there, you see the blue bar, which is rail, and the yellow bars, which is air. Um, this is not to disparage our trucking brethren because a lot of what moves on rail for the preponderance of the distance has to move by truck on either end. Um, but it is just to point out that uh, of all the modes, land modes that are, well, all the modes that are being shipped, um, hazardous, hazardous materials being shipped, rail really is the safest mode uh, by which to do that. A couple of other stats, and I know this can get a little dizzying, but just wanted to cut it a different couple few ways to show you. For every million miles of train miles traveled, there are 0 0.7 uh, accidents. This includes all accidents, not just hazardous materials. When you consider that rail travels 600 million miles a year, 0.7 per million miles does add up, but it's an extremely, no, uh, extremely low number. If you look at this specifically for hazmats, um, since the year 2000, our hazmat rates have declined 78% uh, incidents involving hazardous materials. So today, that is down to 0 0.005 per uh, 1,000 miles. So that's, we have made vast improvements. How have we made those improvements? Um, largely through extensive capital investments in our network. These bars represent uh, the amount of capital that BNSF 
spends on our network every year. It's well into the billions, three billion on average there, five billion in 14 and 15. But this year, we're projected to spend close to $4 billion on our network. The orange bar here represents the maintenance portion of that investment. 72% of our investment goes right back into the existing network to make sure that the rails are smooth, that the grades are smooth, uh, that the ballast is even, um, that all the ties and the, and the plates are connected properly, um, and the, everything moves safely. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of ways, in addition to the, the dollars that we spend, that we monitor that the, uh, the outcomes of that. <clears throat> and we do have equipment te de detection technology throughout the network. These little dots represent all sorts of acoustic, all uh, sorts of technological sensors that we have. We have acoustic bearing detectors that can actually determine if the sound the bearings in the wheel are making uh, are not normal. And then we can identify that wheel set and swap it out at the next stop. Um, you may have heard about the hot box detector that was um, that people were focusing on in terms of the Norfolk Southern Derailment in East Palestine. We have those as well. I think they are um, uh, placed, I think, uh, I got another slide, I won't guess, 40 miles, I think, uh, throughout, every 40 miles at a maximum. Um, these, these sensors collect literally 35 million readings per day. Uh, we have a massive computer system down in Fort Worth, Texas that receives all this data. We've done extensive um, AI where we read all of this data, we identify which of those data components are actually troubling, and then we, actually, we look at those with human eyes and we zero in on what that problem is. It could be a bearing issue, it could be a wheel that's out of true, it could be a crack in the steel wheel. Uh, we have geometry cars, that little third dot, that travel across the railroad. They have cameras, LIDAR, sonar, um, that analyze the track and the track infrastructure so that if there's uh, a sinkhole developing or if there is literally a faceplate on connecting two sets of rail that's missing a bolt, the camera will pick that up traveling at 70 miles an hour, send us a picture of that. It determines that that bolt is missing and then we can send someone in there to fix that before it, the tracks come out of line and potentially cause a derailment. So we are deploying extensive amounts of technology and technological solutions to this. And I might add that all of this was done voluntarily without any government mandate um, because the railroads think it's the good thing to do and it's as important for us for our goods to arrive safely as it is for all the communities that we roll through. Um, a couple examples, again, I've already mentioned the uh, acoustic bearing, the hot box detector. The uh, trains that carry hazardous materials have a special designation They're called key trains. Key trains um, have, are treated differently throughout our network. Currently, uh, we, BNSF, restricts the speed of all key trains to 35 miles per hour through highly populated areas. This would be considered a highly populated area. Uh, and our routes for moving that hazardous material takes into account the communities and the, and the things within the community that we will pass through. Now, we all know that rail runs through, uh, you know, this track's been here longer than all of us have been alive, um, and things have grown up around it, so we can't always account for schools or parks or what have you, uh, but we do the best we can to run to route those materials, those uh, trains through the least, um, you know, hazardous routes. We do extensive training with first responders. <clears throat> I've already shared with, um, with your village manager our uh, bnsfhazmat.com website. I've circled it here on the slide. Uh, this will give anybody further information about some of the points that I've covered today. But if you are a first, uh, first responder, you can sign up and receive information about specifically about what kinds of commodities roll through your community. So I know our, we've been in contact with police chief, fire chiefs, first responders across the network. Um, they are aware of this. They can sign up for this information and receive it. It is not available to the general public. Um, you must be a licensed first responder in order to receive it. Uh, I hope you can appreciate the security concerns that that would raise if this information were released <coughs> to the general public. We also have an Ask Rail app 
that is available on your phone. So should there be an incident, first responders can look at that rail car, punch in the number, and immediately know what commodity they're dealing with. It could be corn syrup, it could be ammonia sulfide, it could be corn. Uh, but that Ask Rail app will tell them what it is, and then they'll know how to prepare for that response. They won't walk blindly into something uh, without being prepared for it. We do trainings uh, both here locally, we have online trainings, and we also will take first responders out to a specially designated training facility that the railroads collectively own in Pueblo, Colorado. It's called CERTC, I forget what it stands for, um, where we actually simulate rail derailments with hazardous materials, and they fight fires, and they learn exactly how to uh, extinguish fires from uh, out of different sources. So the level of training that we do is extensive. If any, if any first responder, if anyone knows first responders that aren't receiving this or haven't had access to this, let me know. I can put them direct in contact with our um, HAZMAT people and we can make sure that they at least sign up for the Ask Rail and get access to training uh, should they wish. Ah, there's my first responder training. If an incident occurs, it is our responsibility to clean up and re, uh, remediate the site and put it back to the way it was. So um, this is just an aftershot, could be anywhere, uh, but that is our responsibility and we stand behind that and we will do that. Um, obviously our first goal is to never be in that position, uh, but accidents do happen and we have to be ready for them when they do. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. I'm happy to take a few questions if folks have them. Mr. Thank President. You. Okay. Hi. Um, so I see that um, the technology you, you use addresses issues that come up. Um, do you do any kind of like regional risk assessment um, to see where there might be areas that need more help along the train line? What kind of risk, risk assessment do you do to be more proactive? Are we, are we talking about perhaps people who might be causing that risk or it could be any could be anything, anything. yes that well we do risk for the train uh, I'm joined by one of our resource protection officers today and he could speak to this as well but we do uh, you know we are very tied into homeland security and other um, uh, emergency response management you know government entities and we monitor social media sites we monitor that for chatter in terms of any potential um, dare I say the word terrorist activities. Uh, we um, are aware of theft rings that often target rail cars for the commodities that they carry. And we work in conjunction again with local law enforcement to try to uh, combat that and put a lid on it. So yes, there are additional risk assessments, if you will, um, dealing with the communities through which we roll. Hello again. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank um, you. I, I was just curious um, about the extent to which you have processes or procedures following derailments, whether it's uh, your railroad or um, someone else's. Um, mm -hmm. Does does is there kind of an investigation process or an audit process? Oh, most certainly. Yes. All all train derailments do then immediately fall under the investigative authority of the National Transportation Safety Board. So the NTSB will be on site as quickly as they can get on site. Uh, we work very closely with them, of course, to help determine the cause of the derailment um, and certainly to fix that. Um, but oftentimes it's just a matter of knowing what caused it and then being able to account for that moving forward if it's a bearing, if it's a wheel that's out of a line, if it was a track that got misaligned, uh, what have you. So yeah, there's an extensive investigation that precedes, no, supersedes uh, an accident. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because it was just um, in the case of the East Palestine derailment, I understand that the hot boxes involved there were entirely in compliance with federal standards, and yet the derailment still occurred. So I was just wondering, you know, if that is identified, obviously there is a uh, gap or a disconnect in what is truly necessary for sure. rail safety. Sure, and I think, um, so just to be clear, uh, hot boxes aren't federally required, aren't mandated by the federal government. The railroads have put those up voluntarily, <clears throat> but subsequent to East Palestine, we have all committed to um, decrease the distance from one to another. So, i.e., essentially double the amount of hot boxes that are gonna be on the network. 
So uh, we will be putting some more on. Um, Norfolk Southern certainly will be. Um, again, coupled with all the other technology that we have, uh, monitoring, wheels, bearings, um, you know, face plates, everything. Uh, it's, you know, it's a complete package that we look at. Yeah. Any other questions? Any questions from anyone in the audience? Since we all live in a town that has trail trains going through it every day. Okay, hearing none. Yes, Mr. Buckley. Dave. Oh, yeah. So one of the things I'd just like to touch on real quick regarding public safety and working with BNSF, it's been a great partnership. Uh, we work with Mr. Scosi, um, the whole police department from BNSF who does a lot of the risk protection. Um, we know each other by name. If an incident does occur or there is something that takes place on the rail lines, uh, the first thing they pull up is they come up to me and they say, what do you need? And they're there to help. They're there to get us resources if we need them. Um, and the communication is huge. You know, we're always talking. We're always making sure that we're looking out for the best interest of not only the rail line, but the entire community. Um, so having those things in place, and I know a lot of people wonder what happens if something bad does happen. Yes, Riverside is the first responders going there. We're going there to start mitigating or handling whatever incident it may be, but we have far outreaching resources throughout the entire state of Illinois and if need be throughout the country where we can call in additional hazmat teams or resources or whatever else we may need to handle or mitigate any incident that occurs um, and that is working directly with the railroad um, and making sure that everything is done properly and you know done right. Our, our main goal is to make sure that things don't happen. Um, rail lines are protected areas. Uh, there are no trespassing zones. The only place you can cross a rail line is at a crossing, at a grade crossing, or at a viaduct or a bridge going over it. People are not allowed to walk down rail lines. They're not allowed to trespass in those areas. Those are no trespassing areas. We work with BNSF to enforce those rules uh, for good reason. We don't want people out there on the tracks where they shouldn't be. They're not safe areas for people to be congregating or walking or um, you know, hanging out. So we try to enforce that with the railroad to make sure that uh, we don't have anything happening within Riverside. So does anybody have any questions for me on part of public safety? Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Very much. You. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Scosi. We appreciate you coming in. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's great information for our residents to have. So thank you. Thank you so much.